Um, I was just talking to Pierre before we started, and I've also prepared a, uh, a little blog post I'm going to uh, push out tomorrow. Um, but I noticed um, that it's two years almost to the day when Pierre asked on Facebook, um, uh, what kind of Agile is your Agile? Now, the really spooky thing was I was um, writing uh, my, my, my new book, Right to Left, at the time. And in chapter two, I specifically said what my kind of agile was using that exact exact phrase. Uh, so when Pierre asked the question, I had a I had a ready answer. Um, so that, that was cool. And here we are, two years later. It's extraordinary how time how time flies. Um, two years later, doing a talk, and I'm re I'm really glad to to be doing this at. Um, Pierre's invitation with, you know, what we can argue is either his title or my title uh, for the talk. Um, so we are going to talk a bit about right to left, and right to left is really about uh, two kinds of agile, uh, majoring on one of them and warning you against the other. I'll explain that in, in a moment, um, but before we do, um, I'm just going to, as I said, I'm not going to share slides, but I will put a few things in chat. So the basic, you know, the intro slide at the beginning of the talk, you know, the, the boring slide that everyone ignores. Um, here's my boring slide that everyone ignores with a few links about me, uh, my books, and my most recent book in particular. Um, it, was, it came out last year. I mentioned I was writing it the year before. Um, it is actually quite new in one sense. The audio book came out just the weekend before last. That's very, very new. Um, so um, forgive me if I still sound excited about, about, about my book. Um, so two kinds of agile. I'm going to explain that with a metaphor. Now suppose you had to explain, and, and like all, like anything you need to explain, it's difficult. Explain it with Lego. So Lego, Lego is my metaphor here. Um, if you had to explain Lego to a Martian, I mean the whole thing, the whole process from start to finish, the whole thing of Lego, where would you start? So uh, would you start on the left with truckloads of plastic granules arriving at the Lego factory? Or would you describe it from the right with children playing with the finished product? So from the left, plastic granules. From the right, finished product, children playing with it. Pretty, pretty easy question. I've not met anyone who hasn't answered children playing with the finished product. Pro product. So starting with the outcome, in other words, of, of that whole um, Lego production process. Now, suppose we were going to explain Agile, where would we start? Would we start with backlogs item, backlog items in Jira? Other tracking tools are available. Or people collaborating over working software that is already beginning to meet needs? So backlog, backlog items in Jira, working software, needs being net, people collaborating, all, all that kind of stuff. Where would you start? Um, again, I think most people would, would, would agree that the right to left version is much more attractive than the left to right version. But I will tell you that the left to right version, the backlog driven version and the solution driven version is the one most often told. Now, if you don't believe me, uh, let's do the same for Scrum. So uh, if you had to describe Scrum, where do you, would you start? Would you start with two, level back, two levels of backlog, planning meetings, and all that stuff? Or would you start with uh, people pursuing their shared objectives goal by goal? So backlogs, shared objectives, and goals. Yeah? Um, the, the, the right to left version, the shared objectives and goal version, goals version, is much, it's much rarer for that to be the place where uh, Scrum is described from. You look up some very respectable sources that explain Scrum, and very often, they will start with that left to right version. You have a backlog, you plan, and so on. So we did the same thing with safe. So how would you describe safe? Uh, is it um, backlog, it backlog items or multiple levels of back backlogs where the number of backlogs is proportional to the height of your safe poster or shared objectives pursued goal by goal? And uh, of course, Pierre, to ch either choke or laugh, I'm not sure which. <laughs> um, now, it turns out those two descriptions for safe and for scrum, they, they are both entirely compatible with their you know, official descriptions. If you read, um, read the scrum guide, you can see it described in terms of backlogs and planning and so on. You can also um, read it in terms of goals and so on. But goals is kind of treated as a bit of an advanced concept. Um, and uh, but by a lot of people explaining, explaining scrum. And I think this is a problem. I think it's a real problem and there's a real danger that every time we explain Agile from the left, you know, in terms of backlogs and so on, 
explaining it in the terms of the old model, in terms, in explaining it in project management terms, um, rather than explaining it in the terms of a complete, completely new paradigm, I think we actually are slowly killing Agile. And the more we do that, I think the faster it will die. And um, if you don't believe that's a danger, just, just look at the number of Agile is dead blog posts or Agile is killing me type blog posts that we've seen over the last couple of years. If you're a reader of Hacker News as I am, you'll see those, those posts pop up with alarming regularity. So I don't want to see Agile die, I want to see it succeed. I, you know, I believe it's, it, it, you know, it, it does something important and I believe it, it can be wonderful. But like a lot of things that can be wonderful or they can be terrible depending on how you approach it. And I really want to stress that Agile should be, should be approached from the right with, um, with needs being met, uh, outcomes being realised and, and so on, not from the left with our you know, backlog of things we agreed long ago. One challenge with all of that is um, where, those, where those needs come from. What needs should we be focusing on? Um, and that, there, there's two answers to that question. Uh, there's one very easy and obvious answer if you're an Agilist, and it comes through collaboration with the customer. As you collaborate with the customer, you understand their needs. The more you see your users in their actual context, the more you understand what their pain points are and the, more, and the better positioned you are to deliver solutions that meet, meet those needs effectively. And the closer the collaboration also, the sooner you will know whether or not that need is being met. Um, and you start to build in feedback into that system and all the rest of it. That's great at the low level, but it is also important that, that those needs are the right kind of needs to be focusing on from the point of view of your products and your corporate strategy and all those kinds of things, strategic questions. Um, and, and for me, a big part of my kind of agile is a kind of agile where delivery and strategy are closely connected to each other. They are different things, but they have to be talking to each other. There has to be participation between those, um, those, those different activities. You know, and if the people doing the delivery don't have a seat at the table in the strategy discussion, then there's something unhealthy going on. It's what, um, it's, it's what we would call as, you know, uh, it's, it's unhealthy, it's unwhole. You know, it's, um, you know our, our mission statement's all about wholeheartedness. And you can't be wholehearted when there's one group of people trying to do one thing, there's another group of people trying to do another. Um, and so the different, these, these different functions, these different, they might be different parts of the organization. It might just be, um, you know, um, different conversations happening in different places, but you need, need that integration. And what we're actually going to do um, as part of this talk is, 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 is an exercise in strategy. And it's taken from chapter five of the book. So the way that the book is structured, we start very easy with a little bit of lean, that's chapter one. A little bit of Agile, chapter two, looking at both of those from a you know, needs-based, outcome-oriented, right-to-left uh, point of view. Then the frameworks, chapter three. And when you're starting from the perspective of needs and outcomes, you start to look at the frameworks quite differently. You don't think of them as solutions to force on people. You don't think about rolling out Scrum or rolling out, rolling out Safe. You see them as sources of inspiration. You see them as sources of patterns that combine in interesting ways. And anyone who's done Scrum and Kanban together will know exactly what, what I'm talking about. Um, you know, I've worked with teams not much bigger than a Scrum team that's not just doing Scrum and Kanban, but it's also doing design thinking. And it's, you know, it's doing Scrum Thinking Week. And 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 it's doing Scrum you know, the whole can be greater than, 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 the, than the sum of the parts. We move on to scaling, a controversial topic. And I don't come down on one side or another on, on the scaling frameworks, either whether they're a good idea or a bad idea, um, or which one I prefer. But I come back again to this, look, approaching them from the point of view of needs and outcomes. If you're not sure what outcomes you want to achieve when you approach a framework, especially something as big as a scaling framework, you are in for trouble. If your attitude to a framework is that it's something that needs to be rolled out and forced on people against you know, their objections, against resistance to change, where they haven't been part again, part again of that strategy conversation, then you're going to encounter pain. And, and um, once you start, once you realize that, then, then your whole attitude to those frameworks complete, completely changes. And they're, they're, they're not something scary anymore. You know, there's something that you can you can draw from and take or leave as as is going to as is going to work for you. 
So that's kind of the, the, the classic Lean Agile stuff, the stuff with Lean Agile branding and, and so on. Chapter five, we get serious about organization design and two aspects of that that are poorly served by the Agile frameworks. Um, and that is um, strategy and strategy review in particular, and also things like service delivery review and so on. I mean, Agile is big on feedback loops. Um, but it's not so great on actually integrating the whole thing into an organizational context. And we offer, um, we offer you know, versions of both of those. So the outside-in strategy review, and you're going to get a small taster of outside-in strategy review, and also outside-in service delivery review, which is something I, um, I, I started doing at, uh, when I was working in government digital um, in the UK. Um, a lot I should say about the book, a lot of it is influenced by my time in government digital. It was a privilege to, to work in it. You don't think of working in government IT as, as, as a privilege, but it truly has been in, in the UK. Um, and I don't know if there are any, any other people on this call who have had any exposure to, uh, to, to the whole government digital thing here, but it has been, uh, been a fantastic, fantastic experience. A learning experience all around, um, but a really, a, a, really, a really good one. And the last chapter um, is about, it's about leadership and supportive organization. You know, the, it's called Upside Down, the Inverted Pyramid and Servant Leadership, all those kinds of things. And again, looking at organization design and leadership behavior from the point of view of needs and outcomes. So making sure that people's needs are being met. You know, that's a key responsibility of pretty much any definition of servant leadership, but also making sure that our work is properly connected to purpose. And um, that's the bit that's sometimes left out of servant leadership, but a really vital part of it. And making sure that we're creating, you know, helping to build the next generation of servant leadership leaders that are going to connect the next generation of people doing the work to purpose and whatever that, however that purpose needs to evolve, um, evolve over time. Um, so that's a real sort of systems thinking view of servant leadership, which I think is completely 100% compatible with the original book on servant leadership, Greenleaf's book, um, published in the 70s now. Like a lot of good things came from the seventies. I was born in the sixties, so I think a lot of good things came from the seventies. Um, so anyway, we're going to move to a little exercise, um, and it's it's about strategy. And if I just find the, uh, the the bit, I'm going to I'm going to put in chat a question for you to ask in your breakout groups. So Pierre's going to, in a, in a moment. Pierre's going to send you out to breakout groups of about five people, and your job is to answer these two questions. So what's happening when we're reaching the right customers, meeting their strategic needs? And following on from that, what new stories could you tell? I'm assuming you don't, you don't have all of what you're about to discuss, you don't have all of it yet. What new stories could you tell when you get all of this right, when you are meeting, the, meeting those right customers, meeting their strategic needs? And there's three strategic needs, I'll just explain. It's their needs, your strategy. Um, it's not your job to implement their strategy for them, but you do need to meet the right needs, the needs that make sense for them and, and that make sense for you. So I'm going to do a 10 minute breakout um, and uh, at the end of the 10 minutes, Pierre will call you back. Uh, ignore the recall button. Um, you, you can use that as a countdown just to, uh, to wrap up your conversations and then, then you'll all come back at once at the end of the time. Once you're in your rooms, uh, Pierre will copy and paste uh, the text I've just put there in chat uh, to, to you, so you'll see them in your breakout rooms as well. And so you don't have to worry about remembering every word of that. And yeah, okay, so Pierre, over to you um, for the breakout rooms. Okay, let's go. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll carry on. I think I'm going to assume we have everybody back. Um, I hope you found that an interesting conversation, um, perhaps a slightly challenging one. Um, and you know, I hope that you can actually imagine ans asking and answering that question in your workplace, you know, be the beginning of a strategy conversation. Um, so I'm now going to um, we're going to do another breakout, another 10 minutes um, with another set of questions. There's, there's more questions here definitely than you'll rem remember. Um, I'll, I will, <laughs> but Pierre will uh, send them to you. So the next question is relative to all that good stuff that you talked about in that first breakout, what stops that? What gets in the way? Um, why is that important? What would you like to have happen? Then what happens? And maybe then what happens again? Um, so just to go th step through that. So what stops that? What gets in the way? That's, that's obstacles. 
And why those obstacles are important, I mean, let's make sure we're talking about the ob obstacles that actually matter, not just the, the niggles. And then what would you like to have happen? Turn those obstacles into outcomes. Then what happens, that's the outcome behind the outcome. Then what happens again is the outcome behind the outcome behind the outcome and so on. And um, you know, the, we're, we're doing a simple version of something more elaborate. I'll give you some, some, some references uh, after you come back. But what we're beginning to do is to model a landscape of obstacles and outcomes that starts with the, out, the obstacles that we feel that we actually experience today. Um, but we're also beginning to articulate some of the outcomes that we would like to get to. And if we organize those in the right kind of way, then we have the beginnings of a strategy, you know, one that has a line of sight from where we are now to where we'd like to get to. So another 10 minutes, see how far you can get with this. What stops that? What gets in the way? That's really kind of one question. Why is that important? Just focus on the important obstacles. What would you like to have happen? Then what happens? Then what happens? It's more than you can probably remember. And Pierre, Pierre will send that out to all your groups after you've, after you've gone. OK, see you in a few minutes. We didn't lose that much people. Hi, Paul. <laughs> yes. Good. Right. So, um, two breakouts. I hope you found those in interesting conversations, quite different conversations. Um, now, um, you may have actually found the second conversation a bit easier. You know, once you start, um, everyone has their frustrations, their obstacles, um, no shortage of those. Um, going from those into outcomes, perhaps those are conversations you've not practiced before, but they're, they're, not, they're not that difficult. Um, so I just want to sort of step back a little and I'll put some more, more links in chat for you to read in, in your own time. So, so what's just happened? You have done uh, level one or layer one of, of the outside in strategy review. Um, there's a template for it you can, uh, you can download and I've, I've shared the link for that. Um, and it's, the, it's not necessarily a template to fill in. It's more a visualization of the, like, like my mental model when I'm, I'm doing these kinds of workshops. So we're going from the outside, so that's from our customers and the environment external to the organization or, or your organization or unit, and working our, our way in through different layers of so customer, organization, product, platform, and teams. And as we're doing it, we're asking a number of questions and there's a kind of a style to them. I call them cleanish. And what I mean by cleanish is that they try not to impose the solution or you know, not to be prescriptive. And they help you build a model as you go. Uh, so that first question is the one you've had already, the customer question on the outside. What's happening when we're reaching the right customers, meeting their strategic needs? And as we said before, their needs, your strategy. And then we work our way in organization when we're meeting those strategic needs what kind of organization are we we can answer that question on its own terms but also in the light of what we've just talked about in terms of the relationship we want to have with our customers um, and the same idea with product through what products and services are we meeting those strategic needs answering that question on its own terms and in the light of what we've discussed previously um, platform when we're that kind of organization meeting those strategic needs what kind of defining or critical capabilities do we need to make it make it all possible? And we can talk not just about technology, but you know, intellectual property, uh, different kinds of process, perhaps um, you know, anything, any kind of capability we need in order to do the kind of job that we want, in order to be the kind of um, organisation we want to be, and and so on. Um, and lastly, teams. When we're achieving all of the above, what kind of teams are we? And I, I stress here. This isn't just about delivery. This isn't just for delivery teams. This is for all of us and how these different teams relate to each other and, uh, and, and so on. Um, so that's the outside in uh, strategy review. Um, something else you've got a tiny, tiny taste of is a coaching game, a clean language inspired coaching game, we call it 15 minute photo. Um, the 15 minute part is self-explanatory. We can do an amazing amount in just 15 minutes. The photo part, is uh, it's uh, short as an acronym for from obstacles to outcomes and in the second breakout you already saw um, some of how that's possible what would you like to have happen you know turning an obstacle into an outcome um, but we can explore that landscape in, you know in, in 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 some richness you know um, what kind of outcome what kind of obstacle what happens afterwards where does that come from um, what else and, and so on um, some simple uh, coaching questions that we use to explore that landscape. 
Um, now the cool, the, the coolest, well, the coolest thing isn't actually the questions, although they're actually pretty cool when you when you understand how they work. The real coolest thing is that we've got everybody coaching everybody else, and that can be as either a whole group uh, activity or a table group activity, or with people rotating through the roles of coach and client and scribe writing outcomes down and so on. And just think how cool it is when you've got a member of staff coaching their manager. You know, so what's your obstacle? What would you like to have happened? What kind of? Um, and then what happens? All, all those kind of questions. And vice versa, the manager um, having those kind of same conversations um, with, uh, with, with, with members of, uh, of their teams and so on. Um, and um, so it's an experience that, that many people playing the game have never had before. Um, and it also helps to train you to recognize when you're asking questions of the wrong kind, asking questions um, that instead of helping the, 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 the person you're talking to, you know, explore what they were thinking and, and, and build that up. You know, instead, you, it's so easy to just to destroy it by, you know, putting things into your own words or, or um, just, you know, trampling over it with your, your assumptions or your recommendations, your solutions and so on. Um, so just 15 minutes practicing that stuff very deliberately can be very revealing and 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 you know we do it a couple of times typically in our, in our workshops and uh, people get a bit of practice at it and they arrive at new insights um, as they do it so um it's there again to download um nearly all the resources on the res in the resources area are um, creative commons are open source very easy to uh, to get hold of the the source materials and and so on so it's probably time to uh, to think about uh, wrapping up. I've been I've been I've been on for about uh, three quarters of an hour. Um, a couple of patterns for you to think about. I've mentioned patterns already. You know, we talked about um, the agile frameworks as sources of patterns. Um, all this work I'm doing now with agenda shift and right to left, and the way I'm I'm encouraging um, organisations to have conversations with themselves. The way I'm helping uh, teams you know, identify their obstacles and turn those into outcomes that they're going to, to strive towards. There's two fundamental patterns at work. Um, and these patterns work independently of the tools. For all of these, both of these patterns I put in, in chat, there are different tools that you can use that will achieve the same, same kinds of results if you approach it in the same, same kind of way. So the first one is Ideal Obstacles Outcomes, which goes by the nice acronym of I Do. So reflecting on when something's working at its best, like you did in the first breakout, and then obstacles and outcomes as you did in the second breakout. And you can do that with clean language, you can do that with solutions focus, um, you can do that with challenge mapping, something I came across recently. Um, and if you're into coaching, if you understand models like the, the GROW model, for example, you'll find that, um, you know, that, that, that page interesting. Most pattern two is just-in-time strategy deployment. And this is kind of the opposite of, designing you know solutions for the organization and forcing it out on people you know it's instead everything just in time you know what once we've agreed broadly what our strategy is making some choices and then developing those choices you know making sure we're choosing the option that's going to have the most impact towards the outcomes that we want to achieve and then um, you know designing the experiments and so on as needed uh, the feedback loops the leadership behaviors all those other things that go to um, sustaining those things um, you may have heard of change happening in cycles, PDCA cycles, for example. Um, um, I'm seeing some nods on the video. Uh, what you, I hope you understand is that these cycles aren't perpetual motion machines. You know, if the organization um, isn't asking for these things, if there isn't you know, some sense of pull that encourages people to start new changes, that, that if there aren't the, 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 the reflections that um, help us you know, understand what we've just done, and how we might do it uh, differently and you know another time and so on um, this process of change just just isn't sustained um, so these are kind these are the kind of uh, concerns that are raised in the second second pattern uh, just in time strategy deployment you can think of uh, lean startup and okr and you know other things like that as uh, as different manifestations of the of, of that uh, generic pattern so I really will wrap up this time. Um, so what is your kind of agile? Um, and where does it start? You know, does it start on the left with backlogs, with solutions? Um, plowing through backlogs of requirements is the surefire way to deliver mediocre solutions to your customers. 
and to have a mediocre or worse experience in the process. Um, I just don't want to have anything to do with that kind of agile. That's not me. And I, and I, and I hope that it's not, it, you know, the, most of you would, 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 would agree that that's the kind of agile that's doing, doing agile harm. You know, we need a kind of agile that's really serious about understanding, understanding needs, not just customer needs, but team needs and organizational needs as well. And, um, you know, making, making sure that there is some sense of connectedness to strategy, some connectedness to purpose. Um, both of those make our work a lot more interesting and we'll do a much better job for our, our customers if we have that needs-based, outcome-oriented and connected, wholehearted um, approach to our work. Um, you know, this is uh, not something to achieve, be, be achieved overnight uh, and it can't be forced on people, but you can begin to open those conversations and I hope today um, you've, got, you, you've got some glimpse into the kinds of conversations that, 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 that can be facilitated, that you can facilitate. Um, whether they're about the, uh, your organizations and the products that it offers to its customers or the organization in terms of the kind of organization it is that it seeks to be and how it uh, organizes its work. So that's the, the formal end to my talk. I'll just uh, paste some final, um, you know, final links and so on. I'm very happy to take questions. Uh, Pierre has uh, kindly agreed to, to moderate those. Um, I don't, honestly don't know if any have gone into chat so far. Um, but uh, we'll give you, uh, you know, a minute or two to, to put them on chat and I will, I will step back and, and wait for Pierre to... Uh... They already know me. Uh, I'm a very bad moderator. Um, <laughs> so I uh, just, if you have questions, open your mic, ask the question. <laughs> that is fine, yeah. Now my hearing isn't perfect, so I may, I may need some help. I do apologize in advance if it takes a couple of goes for me to understand your question. It's not you, it's me. No, so your answer is, if, if you're here, it's bad, you say, and so what? <laughs> uh, Paul, I'm quite sure you have a question. Um, I'm pretty silent so far, but give, give me a moment. Okay. Uh, is it silent to silence or thoughtful reflection? I <laughs> Wolfgang, I can see your eyes. So, so what are the typical problems uh, that you are struggling with? with with this approach and how do you deal with them um i think in in the end the the, the problems that you um you encounter they you you so often see the same kind of problems um and it's very tempting to think well we know what the solutions to those problems are and let's just and let's just implement them and and sometimes you'll get away with that uh, but sometimes that is that is just just a disaster um, and so it doesn't take that long to have those conversations first and I'm, I'm just help, helping that to happen. Um, but you know the kinds of problems, um, there are, there's all the sort of classic problems of you know overburdened teams trying to do too much at once and actually achieving very little. That, 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 you, know, um, you know lean stuff and agile stuff both have um, some, some mul there are multiple remedies to that. Actually the fact that there are multiple remedies already tells you that something interesting is going on. And um, you know, there's, there's, it's either it may be a matter of choosing the best solution, or it may be a matter of well, let's combine these ideas and and, and see and see what happens. Um, a lot of organisations complain about alignment, um, and um, they are at the same time admit to being poor at communicating strategy with their teams, and at the same time complaining that people make such stupid decisions. Um, <laughs> but those those kind of go hand in hand. You know, if, if, if leaders aren't practiced uh, both at um, articulating outcomes, not just once, but repeatedly, uh, but also making sure that they're, they're, that the organization, you know, if they're also not making sure that um, the organization is, um, you know, looking at its progress towards those outcomes on a, you know, re on a regular basis, then um, it's no surprise that different, different parts of the organization will drift off in their own, um, own different kinds of directions. Um, another common one is, you know, where they've been doing some of this stuff for a while and in some ways it makes it worse rather, worse rather than better. And this comes as a bit of a shock to people. Um, but you sometimes you'll have a team that goes very enthusiastically in, in on Agile, but doesn't bring with it um, some of the people on which they're dependent um, or on some of the people that they need to influence in order for them to be successful. Um, so again, there's you know, perhaps a need to just to slow down a little bit uh, to understand what we all want to achieve, and not just what one small bit of small bit wants to achieve. 
Um, there's definitely true that there's only so much you can do at once and you maybe not tackle the whole organization in one go. Um, but certainly it's sensible to try to engage with multiple levels of organization at the same time. You know, I, I recommend at least three, you know, I think if you're only dealing with delivery people, um, then um, you're not going to ask, well, you may not ask the right questions, but you certainly won't get the right, the right, good enough answers to to those questions. And and you know, I keep coming back to this word participation. You know, delivery and strategy need to, need to be together in the room, and you need the dif different disciplines represented, and you need those different um, you know the, the necessary functions of every organisation. Yes, they need to deliver, but also they need strategy, um, and they need you know identity, all the, all these all these other things. Um, and um, just leaving it to teams just isn't good enough. Uh, those teams themselves need some strategy and that strategy needs to connect to the uh, you know, higher level strategy and so on. This is stuff we've known for decades, um, but in giving, you know, kind of rightly giving emphasis to teams um, and cross-functional cross teams at that, that's a good emphasis for Agile to have. Um, but that doesn't mean that some of those old principles don't still apply. Um, and uh, you know we need to understand what a, a healthy organization looks like um, not in you know process terms or you know project terms but uh, you know understand fundamentally um, what conversations need to be happening for an organization to work that was quite a long roundabout answer to a, probably an easy question but <laughs> thank you <laughs> but fine yeah. Martin do you have a question you're on mute and your son left <laughs> <laughs> if I have a question, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, and no. I think I'm I'm also reading up again now uh, about DevOps, and yes. and I think DevOps has has some of the the ideas also presented in here in a way that once you get the the, the automation right, you can really really concentrate on what you're delivering yeah but it's just m maybe only in my head i don't know how what you no, no, i could be yeah, i agree with you actually and i do that in um i get in i mentioned the chapter three of the book the one where i introduced you know different uh, different frameworks and bodies of knowledge and so on um i actually took devops and xp together that would seem like an unusual combination but xp was about massively turning the volume up on feedback yeah in your day-to-day -day development work yeah. And XP uh, and, and DevOps is about um, making sure there's the infrastructure there so that that feedback is there, not just through the development process, but also start to finish, you know, and out, out into production. Yeah. And, yeah. And well, the, well, the short ones and the, and the uh, uh, first yes. of all, the, the well, yes. if you take the... Yes. So the, how, do we, uh, how, do we create, how do we create high feedback environments? And that's partly about... Um, you know, human level stuff, but also we need technology in this, you know, we need technology assistance to achieve that. I mean, now more yeah. than ever. Yeah. And, yeah. and DevOps is part of that. Yeah, yeah what, what, what I really like about, and that's what, what I kind of said now, is, is that if you have your, your high performance IT in place, you can put whatever ID in it and something comes out and the smaller you make it, the more you can experiment. And that's exactly the, the so that you, you, you kind of cut the, the difficult IT out of it and all yeah. the discussion. It's just you put it in there and something comes out yeah. and you can even measure whether it's successful or not. Yeah. And that's the, the conversation you I need think to have. I think that's a 90% degree. I mean, you're never <laughs> going to solve all your infrastructure issues once and for all. No. What I will say, and I, and I hope you would agree with, is that the sooner you do it, the happier you will be. Yeah. The sooner you do it, the more the, the more benefit you will get. Um, the longer you leave all this stuff, yeah. the, the, the you know the, 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 the benefits you know reduce you know quite quite, quite rapidly. It's it's hard to do DevOps right at the end of a project. You know, it's, not not, really, it's not really DevOps anymore. No, um, no. And, no. Um, and I've never seen a team regret getting a getting an end-to-end -end pipeline built early in the project. You know when you've got that sorted then the levels of feedback it can, can generate make it well worth the investment. You're gonna to have to make that investment anyway. Yeah. Do it at the beginning and you get the benefits of it right through, through the project. You know? And I've seen teams um, went, went from nowhere to being able to stand up whole new environments at the push of a button. Um, and um, it's, it's massive, massive, massive benefit to them. Yeah. 
Cool. If I, if I may nice. add to the DevOps uh, Agile discussion, the only uh, kind of um, drawback or challenge I would um, add, Mike, um, DevOps uh, uh, promotes this idea shift left. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to the other side. I, so. uh, I, I, I mentioned shift, shift left um, actually in, in the book. Um, yeah, I, I didn't choose the phrase, but um, what you're asking is to consider sooner what's happening on the right and yeah. you're ready for it and looking for it. And that I would agree with. You know, I might, my definition of done, which I think it yeah. might be one of the links I put there, is someone's need was met. Yeah. And that then provokes a whole lot of other questions. Well, whose need, what need? Right, right. How will we know that it has been met? And at the beginning of the, uh, if you're having that conversation at the beginning, yeah, and self set yourself up to check at the end, it changes everything. And I, I, you know, at risk of, you know, boring you with a story that's uh, 10, 12 years old. You know, I wrote about this in my in my first book. You know, when we discovered validation. Okay. You know, before, if this is before the Lean Startup book came out, but you know, yeah. uh, we, we 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 discovered validation. You know, yeah. and um. It had a profound effect on the whole process, okay. and it was kind of humbling. I did it for re stupid reasons. I was just cross that we were delivering features that nobody wanted, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I said, "Guys, at the end of this this work, there's going to be a conversation. You're going to confirm to him that this is working for you, meeting a need." Mm -hmm. And I was in a kind of that kind of tone. I was quite unhappy, mm -hmm. um, but it it profoundly changed everything. You know, um, the the. The, the dev guy and the and the customer work together you know right you know right. before the conversation they made sure that was going to be a happy conversation not an embarrassing right. one let's put, put it like that and, that and that changes everything mike did that mike did that feedback uh that you were getting there that validation did that speed up the or improve the feedback cycle yes that, that you because, saw because now because now we're trying to avoid an embarrassing conversation they're working together right through the process. So, um, you know, no mistake goes unattended to for very long because, uh, you know, if there's, a, if there's a miscommunication, they're going to they're deal with it. So um, working backwards, you know, they're, they're working through tests to make sure that it's going to go live smoothly. And actually, even after, you know, um, all, the, all, the, all the production implementation bits, are, you know, made sure that that's all, all, all sorted. The, the customer's going to keep an eye on development through, through the development process. And and make and, and no one's going to go into prioritise something that's stupid, because a stupid priority will lead to an embarrassing conversation. Now I've seen exactly the same. You know, prior to this, I was I was CTO at a, a late stage startup when this was happening. Prior to that, I was uh, I was the executive director at UBS, uh, the investment bank. Uh, I left during the credit crunch along with many people <laughs> at UBS. Uh, if you know the story. Um, but I, I remember I, I, I ran fixed income securities, which is an interesting place to run in the middle of a credit crunch. Um, so it's bonds, in other words. Um, there was one trading desk. We saw only members of one trading desk upstairs on the IT floor. Um, but they were the ones that got all the best IT. You know, the, one, the customers that put the effort in um, were the ones that got the best got the best results. And they, you know, they sat with us while the stuff was being developed. And they got something that works, you know, first or second time in production, as opposed to some of these other things where we got the got the spec, built it to spec, and just hoped that it was going to do the job when when the thing went thing went live. So um, there were I, little uh, there were little rabbit trails and deer trails going from their desk back there, and forth. There, there really were. I mean, I mean, we we had people who obviously invested a lot of time in communicating, you know, in conversations with with other groups. But it was very interesting. It was the group. It was the custom group that put the most efforts from their side into the conversation, got the best results from us. Not them blaming the customer either. Um, seriously, um, it is our job to understand what our customers' needs are, one way or another. You know, I'm not going to blame the customer if we deliver the wrong thing. We have to take responsibility for that. Um, but that's 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 what this is all about. That's what right to left is about. It's um, thinking about that moment when that need is met and that outcome is realized and working back backwards from there and doing everything that we need to do aligning the whole process to making sure that we can do that reliably and so on and but mike that doesn't that also it, like you mentioned it, it's about coming from both sides to connect right yep. so it's a it's a personal it's i i take it as i personally look at it as being a personal responsibility from people on the left and people yeah. on the right of finding a way to connect. Yes, right? absolutely. I mean, there are, that's... yeah, there are different specialisms. Um, there's a word I haven't used yet and that's anticipating. 
Um, now, um, you, if you've read Kanban from the inside, you, remember, you may remember that I quoted from a, a plaque that was on the wall at my local Toyota dealership. And it talk, talks about anticipating the mobility needs of people and society. And I wrote a, one of my um, best, you know, best, most read blog posts around that time was anticipating needs ahead of time. And some people are quite upset about it. They thought their job is to be is to do as they're told. <laughs> um, but actually, no, you know, if you're going to be any kind of leader, if you're going to be successful in product development, you've got to anticipate, you've got to anticipate needs. Um, and so, yeah, and, and you can't do work instantly. There has to be some, some, some planning because you're, you're trying to, you know, stunt part the thing at the right time um, to, to meet the customer need at the right time. You're having to make priority choices. You know, what's the right time to deliver what need and, and, and so on. Um, so yes, um, you are working from both ends, but you're just trying to keep that, that moment of realization you know, at the forefront of the whole time. As soon as we think that it's our job to plow through a backlog, it's game over, I think. Um, well, not quite game over. You know, as long as the team has permission to ask embarrassing questions, you will get away with it. Um, but as soon as the team has to ask permission to make an improvement or to have a conversation with a customer or anything else, then, um, yeah, I think it's uh, it's doom time. A spiral of decline. Are are there are there embarrassing questions? Um. Well, like why we're we doing this? What is this? What is this for? Um. You know, I mean, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't think that's an embarrassing question. I would hope that people are asking the questions. Absolutely. In some organizations, Absolutely. In some organizations um, departing from the plan is a problem. Um, and uh, you know you have all these change orders and all that all other sort of um, you know nonsense that goes with goes with with delivery. Um, you know that's that's the model from the last century. Uh, you know we, we we need to be better than that. Um, and agile needs to be a lot lot better than that. And certainly you know the kind of agile that is planned through backlogs, I have no interest in whatsoever. And I think is actually runs the risk of killing agile. Um, and um, I'm going to keep saying that as forcefully as that for, for, for a long time to come, I'm, I'm sure. It, it almost, in that way, it almost becomes a waterfall. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just slicing your, your, your backlog into sprints doesn't, doesn't mean that you're getting the feedback and the validation and everything else. If, not, if you're trying to pack your sprints to the maximum, you're not even creating the, the, the bandwidth for acting on feedback. You know, there's all all sorts of anti-patterns associated with that, that left to right um, approach. Um, so we, you know, we've got to get, if we're serious about achieving outcomes, we've got to orient our process around it. That, that, is, that is the very simple message. So are you, doing, are you saying that if people, are, if a group is mostly right, we have to bring left? Um, I, I I would be a lot happier working with a team that's mostly right than mostly left. But there needs to be there, there certainly needs to be people on the left. You need people worrying about what's the most important thing that this team will be doing next. And if you can't answer that question, you you have a serious problem. Um, you know that's that's a team again that, that doesn't have a strategy. Um, so yeah, you've got as I've said before, we need strategy and delivery. Strategy doesn't mean waterfall. Strategy, strategy means having an idea of where we're going and some of the challenges we're going to need to overcome in order to do that and, the com and making the commitments necessary for us to be able to, to deliver that successfully and, and so on. Um, okay. And you need that at every level. If a team doesn't have a strategy, it deserves to be outsourced. Now, if you can't, exp if, you're not at, if you're not working to demonstrate that you are better than outsource, then then why you know you know that's a, that's a risk that you are taking. I'm not a fan of this answer. I'm not a fan of outsource either, but I'm nor am I a fan of complacency. And, and you know, so all, uh, you know, teams need need to work work at it. They need, they need to work at their game. They need to have a strategy of where they want to get to and and work towards it. You know, if they are just waiting to, waiting to have everything handed to them on a plate. Um, there, there are going to be other teams out there, inside and outside the organization, who can do it better. Uh, yeah, show me. Sometimes you have a strategy is very top down. So it's coming from the top. And, you, uh, and usually we say the teams, maybe I'm, I'm here very right shifted. Meaning the team has the tactic to transform that strategy into something that matters. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, yeah. 
yeah, and one of the boring questions of, from the, for Paul is, uh, who is the customer? Yeah. What's the name? Who will pay the bill? And that's a, a very complex question. And sometimes... Complex question. Who pays the bill and who uses the thing aren't always the, aren't always the same people. <laughs> Um, so uh, yeah, you you sometimes have to manage you know different sets of stakeholders and all of this as well. You know, um, yeah, balancing competing needs. That's that's what um, that's what a lot of managers have to do. You know, you know, a, um, and uh, it's got to be done somewhere. I have a bloody question for you, Mike. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is a real case. Strategy plan is we want to increase profit and reduce costs. That's our strategy. <laughs> <laughs> It's not a strategy that connects where you are with where you need to be in any useful way. That's, that's a high level, big company. This is coming from the board of directors yeah, and pushing that, back, that, right? Your you're real, you're real customer, your real customer doesn't want that, right? It's, that is, that your, is, internal, is, your internal customer wants that. That is management by objectives, that, you know, the grandfather of OKR, you know, that was, that was disowned by the person who created it. Yeah. Uh, uh, it leads to so much dysfunction. Um, yeah. Make the numbers, I don't care how, is, is the next step. And then, then, uh, <laughs> then it gets really dark. Really dark. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't people ask me, uh, how do you respond in an archer way to this? And the answer is easy. Tell me, tell me the one person who doesn't want this. Right. Increasing yeah, yeah. profit, reducing costs. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, anyway, I a question in, in chat from uh, Ulysses, and it's good to. Is he still still with us? Um, yes. Yes, I am here. You're still here. Um, yes. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. And good to see you again. We we met in uh, in Tampa a few months ago before the lockdown. Um, so cleanish strategy. So um, cleanish is a term that comes from the clean language community, and it's for things that aren't you know aren't canonical clean, but it's kind of respecting the principles behind it. So a cleanish strategy is about having conversations where I, as the facilitator, um, I'm careful to ask questions that do encourage thought and do encourage conversations and do help the organization build up a model of what it is they want to do. But I work very hard not to impose my assumptions on that process. And um, there are there are very few assumptions made. One assumption is that you want to reach the right customers and meet their strategic needs. Um, so I take that as a given <laughs> and I make no apology for it. Um, you could argue that the when is kind of an assumption and we actually do explore a time frame in our workshops as well. I mean, um, in all my, in pretty much all my workshops, um, Ulysses will remember um, the, 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 um, the Celebration 5W exercise, a little time travel exercise. What's the who, what, when, where, and my, why of the celebration? Oh, yeah, I, 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 I would like to. Uh, but well, how, how do you do that socially? Because if we talk about uh, beliefs, we, 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 we think about all the companies. So, how, how you create that in agenda shift to, to clean the strategy in conversations? Yes. Yeah, so, um, what are the tools that you use for. Yeah. So, that's the. Um, it, that's, that's written up in, in, in chapter five of right to left. The, the template I put in, in chat shows you the, the structure, the questions. Um, and it's not much more complicated than walking them through the questions, table group conversations, debriefs, all those kind of usual workshoppy things. Um, but also, uh, um, you know, 15 minute photo for developing the, uh, the, the, the outcomes. There's various mapping tools that we can use for organizing the, uh, the outcomes in interesting ways and help see the connections between, you know, what I keep saying, where we are and where we'd like to get to. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a facilitated process. It's, it's not the last word in strategy, you know, I'm, I'm, it, it's, but it's a review process that will certainly challenge their existing thinking. And um, if it turns out they don't haven't they haven't done much thinking at all, then it will show. Um, I did have one experience where um, the company involved actually they couldn't see beyond some critical points. This, we're talking existential crisis, and actually the the lack of alignment between the different groups working on it was was very telling, very very worrying to everybody. Um, um, but most of the time, you know people have at least a vague idea of what it is they're supposed to be doing. And these conversations are a good way of like reaffirming, you know, what it is we're about, what our strategy is and, and so on. We have a question from Akis. 
Yeah. Where do you start from? Identify the customer persona or define the strategy? Yeah, well, that question you asked in the first breakout, you can unpack, unpack that quite a lot, actually. So things like the, the when, the who they are, how do we reach them? Um, talk about stories for different, those different personas and so on. Yes, all, all of that. Um, that one that one question you can you can easily spend an hour on i actually made the mistake of using it in a what was going to be a 45 minute talk at a it wasn't a client of mine it was a, it was a friend's client and i came in to do a talk and we got to slide three was that question and we spent the rest of the 45 minutes and more just on that one question because you can unpack it and the and the other questions that I presented those can be unpacked as well and you know you can introduce different considerations in, in different 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 ways um, so with, you know, with customers it's very much about the customer relationship and what their needs are and which of those needs are strategic and then doing that for a time frame and you're now starting to think about positioning and and you know, as soon as you start to think about competitors being involved and it starts to become you know competitive strategy and it starts to get very seriously interesting um, but for the other levels as well, you know, you start to think about things like uh, structure, channels, values, um, technology, all, all, these, all these different considerations come in at appropriate times in, in the workshop. Oh, uh, you're, um, you're muted. Sorry, hi. I asked a question. Um, do you think that's, whose job is it to, um, to come up with these things? Is it the team's job? Do you see that as a leader's kind of top-down strategy kind of thing? Um, so you are in a large established company, who would typically participate in an exercise like this? Um, it's it's a process and it needs to be ongoing. Uh, and um, you know, it needs, strategy needs to respond to change. Uh, it needs to be informed by intelligence and so on. Um, and it's necessary at multiple levels as well. So um, yes, there, there might be senior people doing you know thinking big thoughts and you know senior level strategy, but um, but layers all the way down. Um, need to have it as well. I, mean, I was alluding to this, this previously. Um, it, it's one of the lessons of this systems theory that you won't, you'd, your organizational unit isn't viable without it. Um, that, what, what we're saying is it's independent, it, independent existence is at risk if it doesn't have it. And if you just think about the competition your team has, and nearly every team has some kind of competition in the, in the modern day, um, you realise how important it can be to, to do it. And you'll do such a better job if you've thought a bit about what it is you're trying to do and how you're going to try and do it and how you're going to do it more effectively next year than this year. Um, not just fixing niggles, but, you know, having had conversations about what kind of team you want to be. The fixing niggles bit has to happen as well. There has to be improvement, but uh, improvement on its own doesn't get you to where you want to be. Any other questions in the audience? Olaf? Thanks, Chanel. Uh, directly not, because it's wonderful, these uh, explanations, and I guess I have to read much more of these books. And That's therefore, no very, questions, very but uh, hey, we're gonna have the time to read. He's a very good salesman. <laughs> Elsa, any, no, any ideas? IT professional. So what we say when it's over, it's over? When it's over, it's over, yes. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Mike, and all you guys. Absolutely. Hope you like it. Yes, thank you. I mean, so it's, so it's very cool to be back two years after the question was first asked and actually to answer it. So, uh, so that is great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Uh, yeah. um, so I, you probably want to say, I'll put, I, I have not shared a deck, so uh, if, you sh if you copy the, uh, the links, you can make sure that, um, copy the chat, you can make sure everybody gets those. Brilliant. That's good. Good. Mm. Well, I hope you like this format. It's certainly nicer for me to actually look at some faces rather than at PowerPoint slides. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> a lot better. A lot better. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. These are bad, they're badasses. The bad guys here in, in the audience. You can't manage them. You have to let them free. <laughs> <laughs> Great talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Bye bye. Ciao. Thank you. Too. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.